I am Michelle Malik and you're watching In The Special. From artists to the greatest of innovators who gave us the technology we use today. It was the power of their creativity which changed our world. But were these creative geniuses born exceptional or was there something in their environment that helped them become what they were? Are people born creative or can creativity be be developed over, over time. That's our discussion today. Joining us for this discussion, Glenn Janulis, who's a cognitive archaeologist and the co-director of the Center for Cognitive Archaeology at the University of Colorado. He also researches on how aspects of human cognition, such as creativity, have evolved over time. He's joining us from Oxford, UK. We're also joined by Ms. Peter Kinderman, who's a professor of clinical psychology, joining us from the University of Liverpool, UK. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Clint, I'd like to begin with you. Now, before we get to trying to understand and answering our uh, essential question here, which is, are people born creative? I'd like to understand the value of imagination and creativity in human history and how that has impacted societies in the past and continues to do so today. Uh, I think the starting point for that would just be looking at the earliest human technologies, such as uh, stone tools, which would have required a fairly high level of creativity to innovate the changes we see, see in the archaeological record. And then eventually we get to the point where we become very proficient hunters and we start trapping animals and storing food. And when you break down how much thinking uh, has to go into all of those processes, you can actually see that there's a lot of creativity required, uh, particularly when you start talking about something as complex as trapping animals and you have to envision, creatively envision the different mechanics of the trap and the behavior of the animal. And that leads all the way up to our current society as far as I'm concerned. Right. Now, Professor Kinderman, we're talking about this and innovation especially. Innovation is deeply linked to original thought and a person coming up with it and then it's uh, changed, uh, the change that's brought with it, whether that's impacting society at large or one specific, uh, specific sphere. Now, in all of that, that brings to mind whether that individual was unique, exceptional, or there was something in the environment that made them to think about that idea. What does science tell us? Are people born more creative? Are some people born more creative than others? So for me, one of the answers to that uh, relates to the span of evolutionary time. So clearly, for human beings, and the way that we've developed our patterns of thinking, not only creativity, but mathematics and, and in, in my particular area, mental health. Over evolutionary time, the differences between modern humans and, and some of our hominid ancestors in terms of things like creativity are clearly to do with genetic evolution. The differences between people now, whether one person is creative and another person is less creative, less creative, I think it's a mistake to infer too much from our evolution and assume that differences between people now are biological or genetic. I think there's an awful lot in our education, in our culture, in the way that we're brought up that can create differences now, which aren't necessarily genetic, genetic uh, determinants on us in, in this biologically determined sort of sense. Right. So here you're taught that there are many sociological factors, many environmental factors that can also determine why person A might be more creative than person B. That's so right. So if, if we think about, about um, some of the little proto-humans that were um, trying to survive in, in our evolutionary past, maybe millions of years ago, those animals would be very different from modern, hum from modern humans in terms of their brain functioning. But there still would have been individual differences amongst those animals, which would not have been uh, necessarily part of their biology, but about the way that they were brought up and so forth. So differences between people today may well be more environmentally determined. Differences between people today and people a million years may be biological. And it's a, mi it's a mistake to confuse the two, I think. Right. Now, Clint, as uh, Professor Kinderman said, that there are many environmental factors that influence uh, a person's creativity. Uh, there can be factors that um, 
hamper it and then there can be factors that allow creativity to flourish. In When we're talking about what hinders creativity in today's society, what do you think are some of the main factors behind it? Uh, that's a very good question and I agree with Dr. Kinderman. Uh, the nuance of what we're talking about when we talk about proto-humans versus today uh, is really difficult to explain, but I think as in part of a book I'm writing about how children are brought up, uh, a factor that hinders creativity hmm. is the way you're raised. If your society or your parents uh, with the schooling structure that you're in solves all of your problems for you and does not require you to think in multi, multiple dimensions to, to solve whatever problem it is you may encounter – whether it be a social, mechanical, navigational problem, I think that hinders creativity because at a very, at a young age, having the freedom to make mistakes and solve your own problems without some authority figure or structure telling you how to do it may be one of the most crucial parts to that adaptive development, particularly mm -hmm. from a neuro neurological perspective. So let me uh, try to understand this more sheltered a person is uh, less likely that they are able to exercise their creative abilities and that's what hinders their cognitive development which leads them to become more creative later in life yeah so the basic idea is that um being raised in a, in a manner that allows you to solve your own problems, make mistakes, uh, go get lost a little bit as it were, mm -hmm. is in many ways a positive thing for a child because we do know that when you engage certain parts of your brain, you, the neural anatomy actually changes. And at a young age, that's very uh, a very crucial part of your development because that's when your brain is your most neurally plastic. Mm -hmm. And so the ability for young people to creatively problem solve as they are going through their adolescence is, is crucial, I think, to development of creative, innovative problem solvers. Professor Kinderman, now this is a question that's going to sound per uh, perhaps very naive, but I do want to uh, get your take on this. People who are artistic and those who want to develop certain artistic skills can they do so and become good at it later on in life? Or is that only possible when they're younger? Okay, so that's a very good question. And uh, uh, the answer is, uh, yes, I think we can develop these skills later in life. So th there's many aspects to this answer. The first is, I just want to agree that creative problem solving, um, especially as in, in childhood, is excellent. And uh, it's also good for your mental health as well as your creativity. There's a movement in the UK called Forest Schools, where we encourage kids to go out and get dirty and maybe even hurt themselves and solve problems. And it's, it's wonderful for um, problem solving, for emotional maturity, for creativity. And I think as we know more about how the brain works, we're realizing, realizing that there is the potential for um, cognitive and even neural development um, very late in life. It is true that as we get very old, there are some sadly depressing degenerative changes to the brain, but broadly people can learn. Um, be a little bit easier when you're young, when you're young, but I think mm. it's still perfectly possible. Mm. And if you're set in a situation where you're given tasks to solve and the freedom and the encouragement to creatively solve those problems, yes, of course, I think we can always uh, develop our skills. Right. Now, uh, Professor Kinder, you and Glenn both are uh, pointing out to something very frequently in your answers, and I want to ask you both uh, this question. Schooling and the type of schooling we see nowadays, and we're seeing a lot of people, a lot of young people say that it is literally killing creativity. Do you agree with that? Professor Kinderman, you go first. I worry about it. I worry about school schooling that is formulaic, very driven by um, standards and uh, league tables for the schools where children are and their teachers are judged in terms of external criteria. And I worry that what we need is for children to love learning and uh, solve problems for themselves. So I worry about it, yes. I wouldn't go as far as to say their creativity is being killed. I just think we need to be careful 
to encourage a love of learning in children. Right. Uh, Clint, do you, do you also agree that killing creativity is a bit of an exaggeration? That's uh, too much? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a kind of a big statement, say, killing creativity, but I, I absolutely agree with Dr. Kenderman. It's a concern, and his topic on the four schools in the UK uh, is one way of addressing that because a lot of young children today do not engage with the materials and the environment of the natural world, the forests, the woodlands. And the forest schools are basically bringing the kids out to the woodlands and teaching them new skills, engaging with materials such as you know plant fibers and wood and things that they just don't normally interact with. But it's really creating within the children a new sort of way of problem solving and thinking through material culture as opposed to this sort of regimented educational st structure that they're in where it's either books or digital data. And I think the forest schools are a really good example uh, that the UK and I'm a part of that project, too, with some bushcraft and survival instructors. Uh, and I think this is something that could be a, a very beneficial program to see mm -hmm. globally particularly as we become more involved with digital technology as part of our daily lives. Right. Uh, now, uh, Clint, one of the problems I see with the educational system is that it is the syllabus, at least, is a one size fits all. Every student is supposed to learn the same thing. And when we talk about creativity, it's supposed to be fostering the individual, the individual identity, original thought, the person coming up with something that's unique. Now, in all of this, we're talking about four schools and all of that, but when you get to higher education and it becoming competitive and a need for that to become competitive because the job market is so competitive, is there a way, do you think there's a way to restructure the schooling system in order for it to become more compatible with the creative needs of students? That is a fantastic question and one in which I don't have an easy answer for. Uh, I'm, I'm completing a doctorate degree at Oxford, but I actually almost failed out of uh, primary school and then I failed out of my first university and I, I suspect much of it was because the school structure was completely untailored for my psychological needs mm. personally. And I look back on that now and I say, what would have changed that? And I don't really know. But I do think things like, again, like the forest schools, adding a lot of diversity into the educational system in which children are given opportunities to problem solve through challenges and make mistakes in a number of different medias and venues. So forest schools being one, digital technology another, uh, maybe mechanical engineering, learning how to program or code computers, all of these different topics are different ways of approaching the world and problem solving. So I think diversity really might be the answer to that question, adding a lot of diversity within the education system. Right. Professor Kenderman, uh, a note that's a bit different from what we've been talking about, but I do feel like it is related somehow to creativity. While we're talking about fostering the individual, if that isn't done, if individuality isn't allowed to bloom, what kind of frustrations does that create within a person and how do they come out uh, in society? Well, I mean, not only in literature, but also in uh, psychological science, one of the more important factors of human existence is a sense of control, control over your life, control over the things that are important to you. So the a, even an education system, which is system which is designed to make the individual fit into the needs of an industrial capitalist society, meh, I, I think that we may well be happier, uh, better off leaving the repetitive tasks to robots and having creative and um, innovative thinkers developed in our, in our education system. So people tend to thrive when they are in control, when they are free, when they are free, when they are um, empowered to explore the world rather than told what to do. So I think creativity and control and maybe even autonomy and freedom are all very closely related things. We tend to have problems, mental health problems, and also social problems, both when there are great inequities in society and also when people are um, 
uh, are not allowed to have control over the things that are important to them. Right. Um, something that uh, Professor Kinnaman mentioned here was the capitalist system. And this is just you, the thoughts I want to take from you as an observer of society, as uh, what you're doing your studies on and your research on. When we're talking about the system we are in place currently, whether it's the jobs we're having, whether whatever we're trying to pursue, there does seem to be this recognition that creativity and uh, is important. There is a need for innovation. But the type of strains that are put on people, it doesn't seem like it's an environment in which creativity can foster. Do you agree with that? Do you think we don't have enough outlets for creative, a creative expression? Uh, I do agree with that to an extent. I think uh, the modern sort of industrialized uh, systems of higher education or uh, education have been be have become so structured that children do not have a lot of, as as Professor Kinnerman pointed out, control or decision making ability, and that level of agency to make your own decisions is crucial. And to use an extreme example, when you get cases of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder that comes from either soldiers coming back from combat or people in a terrifying situation, often what's related to that PTSD is a complete lack of control or agency in a, in a horrifying situation. But to bring that back to education, having the ability to make decisions for yourself requires you to then think through alternatives and logical solutions to whatever decision it is. So it's going to foster and generate mm -hmm. at a very young age in which your brain is very plastic, this creative problem solving skill set. And that I, I completely agree with Professor Kinderman because control, making your own decisions, I think that is crucial Right. to a creative upbringing for a child. Right, and it seems like uh, Professor Kinderman and Clint are agreeing at the same point that it is agency which allows, help foster uh, not only creativity, but also fosters confidence and individuality within a person. On that note, thank you so much, Clint Janoulis, for joining us. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we take a closer look at how taboos are formed and passed on from generation to generation. Stay with us. Welcome back. In every society and in every culture, there are certain things, if you do them or even if you talk about them, you would be judged, ostracized, or even punished. Certain subjects are taboos, and breaking these taboos is dangerous. In some cases, it might even result in death. But where do these taboos come from, and who makes them? And how do they pass on from generation to generation? We take a closer look at the story today. Joining us to talk about today is Professor Peter Kinderman, Professor of Clinical Psychology at the University of Liverpool. Joining us from Liverpool and Dr. Rayshon Ray, Sociologist and Rubenstein Fellow at Brookings Institution. Joining us from Washington, D.C. Dr. Ray, I'd like to begin with you. Uh, thank you, first of all, for joining us and talking to us. Um, when we're talking about these taboos, everybody's, everyone knows what they are. They are these unspoken things that you shouldn't be talking about, things you shouldn't be doing. But not everyone really knows. Actually, in fact, not many of us know where they really come from. What are some of the common origins of uh, how these taboos come into being? Yes, well, that's a great question. Thank you for having me on the show again. So when we talk about taboos, oftentimes taboos are... Uh, forms of deviance. At times, not necessarily illegal forms of deviance, but culturally immoral forms of deviance. Mm -hmm. And kind of the, the, the historical root of how we think about taboos stems from what we think about mores. Mores are oftentimes widely held beliefs that are passed down, and over time they become law. And as it shifts from mores to taboos, there is also a concept in the middle of that and that has to do with folkways. Folkways is the behavior, the guidelines, the ways in which people think about what taboos are. So as an example, there are broadly, broadly held ways in which we think about taboos. Some good examples might be jaywalking, 
spitting in the street, um, the way that a person might wear their head, gu- their head guard, um, the ways that we might think about extramarital affairs. There are a host of things that aren't necessarily illegal, but they oftentimes are viewed as immoral, eating certain types of food. And what's interesting is that certain types of people seem to be held more accountable for taboos as it relates to law and moral order more than others. And oftentimes these individuals are immigrants. Oftentimes these these individuals are low income people. And so these mores and taboos have historical roots that go back generations. I want to jump to Professor Kinderman and talk to him about the stresses that are created within a society when you have certain issues that can't be talked about and they need to be talked about. I mentioned here that there are certain taboos that might even result into deaths. There are many health topics that aren't talked about in the world because they are seen as being uh, deviating from the norm. They are seen as being shameful. How does this impact the health of a society? Well, psychologists have talked about these sorts of issues for decades, maybe hundreds of years. And part of the issue here is about conflict. So one of the very old Freudian ideas about taboos is the idea that um, we have certain rules for living, uh, our conscience, our our moral sense, and sometimes that rubs up against uh, our desires. And so we have a conflict between what we want to do and what we should do. But we also see conflicts between the individual and the uh, dominant society. Uh, We see this with rules and mores and taboos that, for instance, that um, uh, have different rules for the behavior of women than the behavior of men. This causes uh, conflict between individuals or between groups of society and uh, and others. So one of the ways in which these uh, taboos and rules and social conventions can cause difficulties for societies is when people start to challenge the received wisdom of things. And I think it's just also worth bringing in here um, quite an old concept from psychology of a a researcher called Kohlberg, who suggested that as we become more sophisticated in, in our understanding, we move from doing things that would avoid us getting punished to doing things which are what the law tells us to do, to doing things that society suggests we should do, to perhaps a slightly more evolved way of thinking where we develop our own rules. And that might mean people challenging laws on blasphemy or challenging the um, societal conventions on what is the proper role and behavior for women. And as people develop their own moral codes, Sometimes that brings us into to conflict and disagreement with uh, powerful individuals. And I think just to add to what, what Rishan was saying, sometimes these um, rules develop in order to protect uh, those in power. Right. So sometimes you have the emergence of people who are confronting uh, powerful men, uh, kings, princes, religious leaders, politicians. Uh, And so when you get conflict between what the individual wants or what groups within society want and what they're told, Mm. that conflict can cause difficulties. Uh, And and so that's where we get the the idea that um, these taboos can lead to social and even mental uh, problems. And that's a very, very interesting point that you highlight there, Professor Kinderman. And Dr. Ray, that's what I want to talk about here. The morals, uh, the moral parameters that we were talking about that are set by taboos, that you can't do this, you can't do that, and that in, uh, that isn't set in law, that isn't set in the Constitution, but it guides society, it guides certain limits. Does that benefit the powerful and only uh, certain people at the cost of individuals? Yeah, so I completely agree Agree with Professor Kinderman. And thinking through um, who it benefits is oftentimes what we need to highlight. So certain individuals are reprimanded. They are labeled as being deviant. And then it becomes a form of social control. So taboos are used as a form of social control to reprimand one, one group of people and kind of hold them in place, hold them in check to make sure that they conform, to help them to abide by traditional forms of cultural behavior, but on the other end of the spectrum, individuals who are privileged by power, and oftentimes that deals with being at the top of a caste system or at the top of of a socioeconomic status hierarchy, or it might be related to gender or race, 
And part of what we see is these individuals are not held accountable. And what's interesting is who is actually implementing the social control. Of course, we might have police, we might have military, but currently we also have technology, whether that be our mobile phones, whether that be surveillance footage that hold people accountable for certain types of behaviors that other people are not held accountable for. And it leads to a very conformist culture Where on the other hand, you have individuals who are oftentimes free to not abide by the taboos, partly because they are actually making the rules and the laws about what the taboos are and the taboos that we should actually follow. Right. Now, Dr. Ray, while we're talking about how taboos kind of uh, govern society and how in many ways they protect certain individuals while harm others, Is there something good about these taboos? Are they in fact beneficial in a way because they set a standard for what normal is and something that is easy to digest? In some cases, that might be well. I mean, if a person wants to wear an animal costume every day out on the street, that might not be considered normal because that's absurd and that is considered to be a taboo. In that case, Is it good that certain things are just not allowed? You know, that's a really good question. I mean, I mean, is it, are taboos okay? I mean, you bring up a good example about uh, wearing an animal costume. Well, let's take, say, wearing fur, a fur coat. For some people, that's okay. For other people, that is completely not okay. And so in the United States and around the world, we have PETA, which will go around and literally dump things on people if they are caught wearing fur, particularly individuals who are famous, who are celebrities. So this becomes an example of where we don't see individuals who are high status being given um, a certain level of leniency. But it's interesting. A lot of people do think that taboos help to maintain a particular type of social order. I think the key thing is whether or not these taboos or uh, actually have certain disparities that lead to them not being implemented equally and equitably. And oftentimes we see that. I mean, there are certain certain cultures and, and societies where it's, where it's clearly a gender difference or it's right. clearly an immigrant right. difference or it's clearly about race. And so the social order comes into play based on who is actually enforcing it and who they're enforcing it upon. Right. Professor Kinderman, I do ask the same question that I asked Dr. Ray, but with a different angle to it. Now, uh, In the uh, respect that are taboos necessary in some instances, are taboos necessary for individuals and society to make sense of the state a person is in mentally, to understand whether they are uh, mentally sound or not, if they are doing certain things that go completely against what is acceptable in society? Are they deemed to be unfit to uh, preside within society? I'm trying to make sense out of the things that are all, all right to do and what, are, uh, what things are completely not all right to do. Okay, so, so first, of all, first of all, I completely agree with Dr. Ray about the importance of equity. So that, that rules which are applied to one person or one group of society should be applied to all. I completely agree with that. On an individual level, I think that there's another way of thinking about this, which is, do we accept these rules unquestioningly or do we think through them? So there are certain um, mores and taboos and rules in society that I think personally, I think are are pretty reasonable. I, I think the idea of people spitting in the street, for instance, I would regard as unhealthy. But I think that we should have a debate about it, and I think we should discuss it and come to a collective decision about it. So for an individual, I think that we all need rules for getting on in life. We need the the lubrication of a civilized society. Right. Now, Dr. Ray, as Professor Men is also stating that there needs to be a discussion and a debate. There needs to be an openness about these topics that people say shouldn't uh, be touched, they shouldn't be talked about. But in that, often there's one individual that's singled out, they bear the brunt of uh, the consequences that come with all of this. How does the taboo uh, get broken? How does one go against it? And how does it, how uh, does societal transformation come with it? I mean, does it come at the cost of one individual or does it come at the cost of a generation trying to change it? How does a systematic change come about? 
Yes. Yeah, so oftentimes, oftentimes, all of that is true. And similar to what Professor Kinderman is talking about, I think marriage equality in certain countries is a, is a great example. Uh, women having the ability to drive is another great example. Women have the ability to decide what they do with their bodies and who they might marry and whether or not their families loan them out or sell them out are all examples of changes, shifts in many ways that have been beneficial for society. And yes, when we think about at what cost does it come at? It can be a generational cost. It oftentimes is definitely an individual cost associated with it, but people are oftentimes willing to pay that cost. They don't necessarily wanna be conformist when they think that things are, are incorrect or actually applied inequitably. Instead, they then become rebels. And oftentimes when people become rebels, they challenge the taboos that exist. They challenge the laws that are on the books. And what that means is that they end up protesting oftentimes in various ways. It doesn't always necessarily mean protesting in public at a rally. It could mean protesting at their own dinner table with their own family members in terms of protesting what they should and should not do. It could mean wearing a particular type of clothing. It could mean actually voicing their concern, using certain words, um, actually engaging in public displays of affection. And these are all ways that we see protesting. Yes, there are heightened consequences for individuals. And oftentimes, individuals who are most marginalized marginalized bear the brunt of, uh, of the consequences from the social order, from police, from technology, from the military, about the sort of social control that's put in place. But what's interesting is, again, people are oftentimes willing to make uh, make those sacrifices. And then it ends up having, uh, it ends up paying dividends for future generations to not necessarily have to deal with the same taboos that might have created inequality in their lives. Right. And in this chain world where we're seeing uh, heightened pressures being put on different cultures by other countries in which there is more awareness regarding things that kill people even but weren't talked about because of globalization, because of social media. Do you think that these taboos that existed before with such great force are now being challenged more than ever before? Yes, I think they are. And part of the reason is because taboos oftentimes is what we consider to be normative. But as Professor Kinderman stated, these are things that we have simply accepted as being correct or accepted as being right, and some which are completely reasonable, particularly when they cause harm or, or unhealthy consequences for other people. But social media has allowed oftentimes individuals who are unheard to speak. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about protest as being the voice of the unheard. And social media are operating in a similar venue where people can circumvent traditional channels of communication, talk directly to journalists, talk directly to policymakers, talk directly to people, and are starting to shift public attitudes. Because when we talk about taboos, that's and many times what they are, we make the assumption that most people are OK with the taboo that we hold, that we hold dear. And then when you start to explore people's attitudes, you start to find that people are quite diverse. And so part of what Professor Kinderman was stating about, about having a debate, having a conversation is part of what social media can do in terms of spurring the fact that people are not OK with certain taboos that's creating differences among people. And instead, we should have a discussion about new taboos or potentially new norms that guide society. And we're seeing young adults around the world who are pushing for these changes as they hope for a better society. Great note to end the show on. If we had not challenged some of the previous taboos in the past, we, had not, uh, we would have not gotten rid of the oppression, uh, the brutal oppression that existed yesterday. And we won't continue to get rid of some of the terrible ills of society if we don't critically analyze what is happening. Thank you so much, Professor Kinderman, for joining us and Dr. Rishan Ray for joining us. Thank you for watching Indus Special. We will see you again next time. Till then, goodbye and take care.